usually this conversation happens because people say, are you vegan or why are you vegan? And you can start, you can say, well, you know, the animals in the environment and tell them all the reasons they should be vegan. Or you can share your story and keep it brief. This is what happened to me. This is what I learned and why I changed and how I've benefited from making this change. Nobody can make your story wrong. Give them a little bit of information to let them know, you know, why this choice has been empowering and why you feel excited to be able to share it with them. And there's this great thing called the internet where they can go and get the rest of their information. Kia ora, vegan body coach, family. It's so good to be back on the mic with you. My name is Jackson Burden. I'm a coach, personal trainer, gym owner, and online nutritionist for vegans, vegetarians, vegetarians, the whole works. This is a space that I've created for people just like you to come and learn and to engage with other like-minded individuals that are focused on a fit, healthy, plant-based lifestyle. The voice you heard earlier was Dr. Melanie Joy someone who I'm sure many of you are aware of and someone that I've looked up to and listened to and learned from for the past couple of years as I seek to understand and seek to gain a better way of communicating with the non-vegans in my life. Dr. Melanie Joy is a Harvard-educated psychologist, relationship coach, and communications specialist, and she is the world's leading expert on the psychology of eating animals and the psychology of veganism. She's the award-winning author of six books, including Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows, Beyond Beliefs, A Guide to Improving Relationships and Communication for Vegans, which is the one I'm diving pretty deep into right now, Um, another one called Vegetarians and Meat Eaters, and another one called Getting Relationships Right. I'm pretty sure she's also just released another um, another book as well. So there's a, there's a range of publications there for you to jump into with Melanie. She's prolific in the publishing scene. But her work has been featured by media outlets around the world, including the New York Times, the BBC, NPR, and ABC Australia. And Dr. Joy is also the founding president of the charitable organization Beyond Carnism, and which we will chat more about at the end of this episode. I'm sure like many of you, I've found myself over the past three to four years as a vegan and vegetarian in many conflicting conversations with friends and family members uh, and just people I meet at events and parties, conversations around eating animals and the transition to eating plants. And I have to say, not all of those conversations have gone the way I would have liked. And by that, I mean Both parties have left the conversation not really achieving anything apart from offending or maybe shaming the other person Uh, and heart rates have gone up and blood pressure has gone up and it puts tension in relationships that I would rather not have tension in. And so I've been diving deeper into how can we communicate better with the people around us that don't necessarily share the same beliefs as us when it comes to whether it's compassion for animals or the environmental side of things or even when it comes down to what's optimal for health. So Melanie Joy is one of the world's leading experts in relational literacy and communication, especially between vegans and non-vegans. As the whole vegan movement and plant-based movement grows worldwide and it's grown at an exponential rate, if we want to see that continue and we want to do it without creating many enemies along the way and potentially, you know, touching people that are the, the furthest from becoming vegan, like myself, you know, I was one of those people that... You, you would never have thought I would have gone vegan. I was a hunter. I was well into my bodybuilding, eating chicken and eggs every single day, um, I was closed off to anything that was away from the traditional norm. So if we want to reach people like myself, we have to get better at communicating and having those tough conversations and answering that question. Why are you vegan? Why are you eating that? Um, being able to work through the what we what will Melanie terms the carnistic defense mechanisms, right? Being able to respond to some of those questions, but also knowing when to advocate and when not to. At the end of the day, 
all humans just want to be validated, be seen, be accepted. And if we leave every every conversation with hot heads and anger and a misunderstanding, we're not achieving anything. So that's what Melanie's here to do today, guys. So strap in. This is going to be a big episode for you, but a practical episode that you can take away today and use in a conversation with somebody around you. With that being said, let's get stuck into this one. Thanks for tuning in. This is the Vegan Body Coach Podcast. I'm Jackson Burton, your host, and this is episode 27 with Dr. Melanie Joy. You are listening to the Vegan Body Coach Podcast, all about optimizing your strength, fitness, and physique through a plant-focused diet. My name is Jackson Burton, and I'm a nutrition and training coach for vegans, the plant-centric, and plant curious. I'm sitting down with athletes, experts, and influencers around the world to inspire you to create your best vegan body yet. Cool. Well, Melanie, thank you so much again for joining me today. Um, I think our listeners are going to really love this one. It is a, it is a, um, a slight tangent from what we usually discuss, which is more health and fitness-based um, topics, right? But I think when diving into anything around a plant-based diet or a vegan diet, communication is is just so essential. Like you say in your book, it's like we're never not communicating. You're always communicating something. So how can we um, best do that? And especially when it comes to veg and non-veg relationships, how can we um, navigate so many of these these issues that I find coming up with myself and with um, clients and with members that are all navigating this whole this whole new sort of situation they find themselves in. So I guess before we dive in, do you want to give the listeners just a little bit of uh, insight into how you got to where you are now in terms of you being such a well-respected um, thought leader and author uh, in the area of communication and specifically for for vegans as well? Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, and and I, uh, you know, I think when you're talking about health, it's really important to have a holistic conversation when you can. And, and here we're going to be talking about relational health. Mm. And you know, study after study has shown that people who are in healthy, connected, you know, connected, fulfilling relationships fare better in pretty much every area of life. I mean, they they live longer. They're at reduced risk for a variety of diseases. They're less likely to develop depression, anxiety, and they're also more likely to achieve success at whatever they set out to do. So talking about relational health is very much, you know, a part of, of talking about health. And so I'm really looking forward to this conversation with you today. Um, and my relation, my, my work focuses, um, to some degree on communication, more broadly on relationships and in answer to your question, how, how it all started out, um, I, like many people, I grew up with a, a dog um, who I, I loved like a family member. Um, I also grew up eating animals. Um, and for many, many years, I just, I never thought about how strange it was that I could, you know, pet my dog with one hand while I ate a pork chop with the other. A pork chop that had once been an animal who was at least as sentient and, and conscious as my dog. Um, one day in 1989, I ended up eating a hamburger that was contaminated with a very dangerous bacteria, Campylobacter. And I was, I ended up on um, intravenous antibiotics in the hospital, extremely ill. And after that day, I stopped eating meat. Um, and I, I just, I became like a vegetarian by accident, mm. essentially. And I was in the process of learning about my new diet and how to cook for myself um, and, you know, how to shop for myself, which of course led me to information about animal agriculture and what I learned shocked and horrified me. Um, I, I just, I couldn't believe the extent of the suffering of, you know, the impact on the climate, and human health, so on and so forth. Um, but what shocked me in some ways even more was that nobody I talked to about what I learned was willing to hear what I had to say. They would say things like, don't tell me that you'll ruin my meal and call me a yeah. crazy vegan hippie propagandist, you know, and this, this is what I know you wanted to talk about today. Yeah. And so I became very curious about how rational, compassionate people like myself, you know, could just stop thinking and feeling when it came to this issue of eating animals. And this is what led me to do my research on the psychology of violence and nonviolence broadly, and specifically to write my doctoral dissertation on the psychology of eating animals. And 
it was after writing that book, um, the book that emerged from this research, Why We Love Dogs, Eat Pigs, and Wear Cows, we can talk about that, The Psychology of Eating Animals, um, that I also came to realize um, as I was giving talks about my work around the world and trainings for vegan advocates around the world, I, I came to realize that there was there was this other problem that really needed to be addressed. Um, so many people would become vegan or they become plant-based. They get healthier. They feel more in alignment with their values. They feel like this is one of the most empowering choices they've ever made. And then very quickly, their inspiration would turn to shock and horror when they recognized that their relationships and communications were breaking down. Wow, yeah. And so I kind of merged these two parts of my life because as I had been doing work on the psychology of eating animals and training advocates and talking about this issue. Um, I was also working as outside of the vegan movement as a relationship coach. Um, my area of specialization is relationships. And so I kind of started to wed these parts of my life. Um, and so now what we do at my organization Beyond Carnism is we, we try to raise awareness of the psychology of eating animals. Um, and to help shift this way of thinking. And we also empower people who have adopted a plant-based diet or a vegan diet to be able to communicate about this issue more effectively. And we help people just more broadly develop healthier relationships with other animals, with themselves, with other advocates, and so on. So this the psychology of eating animals, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you've come up with this term carnism or this carnistic sort of psychology or carnistic mentality that we have within society can you i mean it is starting to gain some traction now i'm seeing it around more and more which is so cool because i love i love the concept and you know it just describes things so well and puts things in, into perspective for people but maybe for the listeners can you just outline what is carnism and and how does that sort of um, affected how society is, is structured Sure. Yeah. So, so what my research led me to understand when I was doing my um, doctoral research was uh, what my research led me to identify was what I came to call carnism, which is the invisible belief system or ideology that conditions us to eat certain animals. It's essentially the opposite of veganism. Mm. Um, we tend to assume that only vegans and, and vegetarians follow a belief system, right? But the only reason that we might learn to eat pigs, but not dogs, for example, is because we do have a belief system when it comes to eating animals. Um, when eating animals is not a necessity, which is true for many people in the world today, then it's a choice and choices always stem from beliefs. But mm. we don't learn that we are following a belief system when we choose to eat animals because this belief system has largely been invisible. So, you know, we just grow up in this dominant carnistic culture and, you know, learn that eating animals is normal, natural, and necess necessary. It's just mm. a given. It's just the way things are. We rarely, if ever, question it. But carnism is a special kind of belief system, and it's really important to understand this it's um on one hand it's a it's what's called a dominant system that means it's invisible it's so widespread that it's woven through the very structure of society to shape mm. norms laws beliefs behaviors etc and it's therefore embraced and maintained by all of the major social institutions so for example when we study nutrition we're actually studying carnistic nutrition Right. We just don't recognize this bias because it's just built right into the system, essentially. And carnism is also violent. Um, it's a it's an oppressive system. It's a violent system. It's structured like other violent or oppressive systems like patriarchy, classism, racism, and so on. Um, it is structured um, in such a way that it runs counter to our core human values of comparing, uh, caring, or compassion. And, and justice, which is fairness. Most people would be deeply offended and opposed if they actually knew what was happening. If they knew that, for example, in just one day, more farmed animals are slaughtered than the total number of people killed in all wars throughout history. And that these individuals are slaughtered, raised and killed in such a way that it would profoundly disturb even the most stoic of us, most people, if they really made the connection, if they really knew what was going on, would be on the streets demonstrate, demonstrating against this, mm. not lining the pockets of animal agribusiness. Mm. And so 
when um, we're born into this a dominant system such as carnism, we inevitably learn to look at the world through the lens of carnism. We like we absorb this way of thinking, this mentality that I'll, I'll talk about in just a minute. And the mentality that we absorb, this carnistic mentality, causes us to feel defensive against anything that would help us see carnism clearly, see the issue clearly. It causes us to defend any information, to, to feel defensive against any information that would help get us out of the carnistic box. So violent systems like carnism that run counter to our values, they need us to keep supporting them. Carnism needs people to support it who would normally be in opposition to it. And so what carnism does is it uses a set of psychological defense mechanisms that distort our perceptions and disconnect us from our natural empathy toward the animals we've learned to classify as edible so that we can feel comfortable enough to consume them. So when we look at a hamburger, for example, like imagine, for example, that you were in the middle of eating a hamburger and let's say that you ate meat and you're in the middle of eating a hamburger and you bite into it and the person sitting next to you says, hey, you know what? That hamburger isn't actually made from cows. It comes from golden retrievers. Mm. So chances are your experience of that hamburger would dramatically change even though nothing about the burger itself actually changed. What you had just seen as food, you now see as a dead animal. Mm. What you had just felt was delicious. You now feel is disgusting. And so rather than continue eating the burger, you probably want to throw it away. That's because carnism has not distorted your perception of golden retrievers. You haven't learned to think of them as edible. So you see clearly when you look at the hamburger, you see it for what it is. And you connect with your authentic emotional response to the idea of eating somebody's dead body, essentially. Absolutely. So I guess you, you, you spoke there a little bit about some of the the like defensiveness that comes up and and you term this in in the book um which for the listeners is is uh beyond beliefs which i've been working through myself um it's um carnistic defense mechanisms and i've really loved the the whole description on these defense mechanism and and these primary and secondary defense mechanisms um that come into play and and just all these conversations you have with a um, and a non-vegan, and when they you know unknowingly are uh, coming up with these de- de- defenses for carnism, um, when like you mentioned before, in all reality, they are probably um, somewhere on the scale of empathy and compassion themselves. Like if they if they really saw what was going on, they would be you know probably doing a similar thing. But there is this kind of yeah, there's this defense mechanism that just pops up and without even knowing it, they're suddenly defending um, this this whole thing. So can we run through some of those defense mechanisms and maybe how we can um, work through those in conversations? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one defense is, um, is abstraction or de-individualization. Basically what this means is that carnism teaches us to think of farmed animals as lacking any individuality or any personality of their own. So we learn to think for it or to believe, for example, that a pig is a pig and all pigs are the same, right? So most people, you know, this is a distancing mechanism. It's easier to consume individuals if you're not thinking of them as individuals. However, you know, pigs are as intelligent, if not more intelligent, actually, than dogs are. And obviously, they have personalities, and and some people even keep pigs as companion animals. Um, We also learn to see animals as, or farmed animals, um, in this case, as as objects. Uh, This is the defense of objectification. We refer, for example, to um, the chicken on our plate as someone uh, or as something rather than someone. It's much easier to consume someone if you think of them as an object. Um, Carnism also teaches us to believe in a whole mythology around eating animals. You know, it's it's the defense of justification. The way we learn to justify eating animals is by learning to believe that the myths of meat, eggs, and dairy are the facts of meat, eggs, and dairy. And Mm. All of these myths fall under what I refer to as the three ends of justification. Eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary. And of course, 
These same arguments have been used to justify violent practices throughout human history, right? Mm. From male dominance to, to heterosexual supremacy. Yeah. And so, you know, for, for people, for, for anybody, vegan or non-vegan, it's very important to recognize carnistic defenses for, for what they are. Otherwise, we buy into their narrative, we buy into their story. So those of us who are vegan, for example, can end up just getting caught up in this debate of, you know, this battle of justifications, you know, but no, but, you know, but no, but coming back and countering argument with another argument, of course, some justifications you actually do need to address because if a person really thinks they're going to die if they stop eating animals, then you've got to help them recognize that that's not true before you can get to the deeper conversation. Um, Carnism uses a spe special set of defenses as well that condition people not only to, um, have distorted perceptions about meat, eggs, dairy, and farmed animals, but to have distorted perceptions about veganism and vegans and the yes. vegan movement. So I classify, to, I, I talk about two different types of defenses. There are primary defenses, which basically teach us to believe in the meta myth, the narrative that eating animals is the right thing to do. Yep. These defenses validate carnism. Mm. And then there are secondary defenses that teach us to believe that not eating animals is the wrong thing to do. So primary defenses teach us to believe that eating animals is normal, natural, and necessary. Secondary defenses teach us to believe that not eating animals is abnormal, unnatural, and unnecessary. Secondary defenses condition us to resist any information that would help us to see more clearly. And as I said before, step outside of the carnistic box. One of the key ways that they do this is by uh, teaching people to believe in negative stereotypes about vegans, right? So it, this is a form of shoot the messenger. If we shoot the messenger, we don't have to take seriously the implications of their message. So for example, I talked before about how, you know, nutrition, like, like all social institutions, is permeated with carnistic bias. However, as soon as somebody challenges carnistic bias, points out the bias of the system, they're automatically called biased. So vegans, you know, you might know this, as soon as you're plant-based or you're vegan and you start talking about veganism, all of a sudden your message is discredited because right. you're, you're accused of being biased. Yeah. Um, another way this happens is by framing vegans as, um, as uh, overly emotional, um, animal-loving sentimentalists. You know, and if somebody is overly emotional, by definition, they're not rational and somebody who's rational is not worth listening to. Mm. Of course, this same stereotype has been used to discredit people who were fighting against the um, or fighting for the abolition of African slavery in the United States or the suffragists who were, you know, advocating for the women's right to vote. When we call somebody overly emotional, it's a great way of discrediting their message of, of shooting the messenger. And Frankly, if you think about it, um, the emotions of, of sorrow or grief, or anger, moral outrage at the atrocity that is carnism, the global catastrophe that is carnism, are actually legitimate, helpful emotional responses. Mm. Much more concerning is the widespread apathy and numbing mm. of the dominant culture. So when we recognize, and these are just a few of many defenses, but when mm. we recognize these defenses for what they are, um, we're less likely to buy into the story that they're telling us. Vegans, for example, are less likely to feel ashamed of being too sensitive of, you know, and, and non-vegans are, are less likely to be influenced by the distortions caused by these defenses. You know, when a non-vegan recognizes, oh, well, you know, this idea that it's normal, natural, and necessary to eat animals, where did that come from? Mm. Is that really based on fact? Or is that maybe the result of a widely held set of opinions that have never really been sufficiently challenged to be destabilized? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. And I, I guess, I guess so, um, you know, I guess if we, if we look at it on like a practical level, when chatting with a lot of people and they're in these dis discussions, whether it might be at a party or they're with family members, um, or it's just a, a general chat with somebody they meet, 
um, often, you know, these yeah these defense mechanisms will crop up all the time, and you find yourself as the vegan that the onus is <clears throat> is on you to have all the answers, right? And so you need to um, you describe it really well in the book at, at one point, and is you need to be you know have all the knowledge on the environmental side, and then you need to know um, how it's going to affect um, economics, and you need to know all of these different aspects of what the what the diet and how it pertains to how we live as humans. Um, I think I, in those situations, as I guess a practical takeaway for people, what would be your suggestion? Should people just stand there and be trying to answer these questions, um, or should you know, is there a, should they just exit the conversation? Um, because there is that aspect of with a lot of people, and I found this for myself when I initially transitioned. Because, like you were saying, it was because of the atrocities that I that I transitioned in the first place. That it is very easy to become emotional in these conversations because uh, because it, it's an emotional topic for for vegans because they've seen some kind of trauma, right? Um, but then you risk you risk becoming the person who is seen as as just another angry vegan when yet you the, the only natural response I guess is anger. So um, in those situations, you know, should people uh, what I guess what are some tips for people to to navigate those kind of maybe more tricky conversations um, around these carnistic defenses? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, first of all, it's really important to give yourself permission not to advocate. You know, veganism is like the job that you never punch out from at the end of the day. And so many vegans, because we care so much and we're so aware of what's happening to the animals, to the environment, we're so aware, we feel this need to use every opportunity to help wake others up. The problem is that that can really exhaust us and burn us out. And so it's very important to give yourself permission not to advocate. Don't advocate when you're in a situation where um, the other person is like really resistant to what you have to say. If somebody says they really don't care, take them at face value. Don't be an expert on their internal reality. If they say they don't care and they don't want to know, give them permission to not care and not want to know and move on. You know, um, often these are people in our own families, you know, people mm. who are closest to us. So this is, it gets a little bit trickier, mm. but even more importantly to, to, to not advocate in those situations. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Also don't advocate when you feel like it is compromising your own sustainability. So many vegans end up burning out because they can't stop. They can't turn it off. And sometimes you want to go to a party and you just want to be you. You don't want to be the vegan who has to have all of the answers <laughs> yeah. and who has to live up to this per perfect ideal. You know, this, I, this, this, you know, this impossible ideal where you have to pretend that your nose isn't running because you're mm. afraid one sneeze and people are going to tell you that it's your diet that's making you sick. <laughs> and yeah. you like use that as an excuse to discredit everything you stand for. Yeah, right. When the guy next to you has just gotten over, you know, just had quadruple bypass mm. surgery, but oh, it's bad genetics. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. yeah. It's hard. It's really hard to have to live up to this expectation that we have to be perfect ambassadors and always on all the time. Give yourself permission not to advocate when you need to take a break and when you don't want to be talking about the issue. And that's an investment in your own sustainability and your own longevity. And the longer you stay in this movement, hopefully for the rest of your life, the better it is for the cause. And when you are talking about the issue, you know, try not to feel, uh, compelled to over inform. And this is another thing that like exhausts vegans when they're in conversations. Understandably, we get into a conversation with somebody, they seem a little interested, they seem a little open. It's like, okay, I can get you to go vegan now. But I want to make sure that you don't leave this conversation with any stone left on turn. So yeah. yeah, you like baking tapioca. It's great. Oh, ground flax seeds, type two diabetes, Neil Barnard's book, you know, and people yeah. can only take in so much information. So Make your goal, Colleen Patrick Goudreau, another author, says, just make your goal in any conversation just to plant seeds. Mm. That's it. Share the truth of your experience. Usually this conversation happens because people say, are you vegan or why are you vegan? And you can start, you can say, well, blah, you know, the animals in the environment and tell them all the reasons they should be vegan. Mm. Or you can share your story and keep it brief. This is what happened to me. This is what I learned and why I changed and how I benefited from making this change. Nobody can make your story wrong. 
give them a little bit of information to let them know, you know, why this choice has been empowering and why you feel excited to be able to share it with them. And there's this great thing called the internet where they can go and get the rest of their information and yeah. you can have a pamphlet with you and say, here you go. And then you keep it short. So remember, you know, also that, Underneath this difference of, you know, vegan, non-vegan, when we're communicating with people who are, you know, have a different ideology, is a relationship between people. And that's really where our focus always needs to be. Am I communicating? Am I engaging with you in a way that's helping to open your heart and your mind to this conversation? And am I feeling like I'm keeping myself safe too? Because vegans are often on the receiving end of, you know, pretty disrespectful behavior and communications. We need to like make sure we're taking care of our own boundaries. Mm, yeah, I think that's really common. Um, I guess uh, one of the things you do discuss is the idea of um, discussing rather than debating um, in, in these conversations. And a lot of the time it ends up, I've found myself in situations in the past where I've been in more of a debate um, which never it never ends well because I the the only really outcome you're trying to go for is to win the win the conversation right, right. Um, and it never I always would leave those conversations going you're you're an idiot like that was that was not the right way to go so um, in this whole idea you've got this idea of fo focusing on a, a healthy um, process rather than the content of the conversation um, can we can we dive into that a little bit and and how that is kind of played out in a conversation like what is the the process versus the content yeah absolutely um let me bring this to a slightly more meta level um mm. because i think that will go further for people so in any healthy relational dynamic interaction and communication is the primary way we relate the primary kind of relational dynamic we engage in right um there there's one formula that i share um in in my new book in getting relationships right and also in beyond beliefs um and this formula for i call it the formula for healthy relating this this formula you can apply to any interaction no matter how brief no matter what form and any relationship whether it's a relationship with another human, with another animal, you and the environment, between social groups. Um, and the formula is this. We practice integrity and honor dignity. That's it. Practice integrity and honor dignity. And this leads to a greater sense of connection and a greater sense of security mm -hmm. with you and whoever you're interacting with or whoever you're in a relationship with. Practicing integrity means treating the other person the way you would want to be treated if you were in their position. It's respecting them, practicing compassion and justice toward them. So practice integrity, honor dignity. That means you perceive them as being fundamentally worthy of being treated with respect. They have no less worth or value on this planet than you or anyone else. And this leads to greater connection and security. So this applies. This is the formula. If you think about a relationship in your life that you consider a pretty good relationship, Chances are you feel that that other person practices integrity towards you and honors your dignity and you feel connected and secure with them. And if you think about a relationship in your life or even a communication that's not so great, chances are you feel that the other person has violated their integrity and harmed your dignity. You feel disconnected from them and insecure in that mm. engagement. Mm. And this formula exists on a spectrum. You can practice it to a greater or lesser degree. And you can apply it, as I said, to everything, including the way that you relate to yourself. So getting to your question in a communication, what does this look like specifically, right? So in the communication, in any communication, there are two parts. There's the content, which is what you're communicating about. It's the topic. And there's the process. And that's how you're communicating. We tend to overfocus on the content and underfocus on the process, but the process matters more. So if you think about a conversation you had like six months ago, there's a possibility you don't even remember what you talked about anymore. Talk to somebody at a party. Well, six months ago, maybe you weren't at a party, but, but you're in New Zealand. Maybe <laughs> yeah, you were. We were at parties, um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So jealous. Yeah. Um, so let's say there you you forget the conversation, you forget the content of the conversation, but probably you remember how you felt in that conversation. Mm. The process determines how you feel. So the focus needs to be on the process. When we have a healthy process which follows this formula, we can talk about anything without arguing. And when we have an unhealthy process, we can't talk about anything without arguing. 
So in a healthy process, our goal is not to be right, which means to make the other person wrong. It's not to win, which means to make the other person lose. It's to understand, it's mutual understanding. It's to understand the other person's thoughts and feelings and help them understand our thoughts and feelings. Once you have that goal, then you can build on to that and say, okay, well, here's what I would love you to understand about my orientation. This is why I'm vegan. I just want you, I really would love you to understand me and where I'm coming from. As long as your process is healthy, you can talk about anything um, without arguing, even this issue of, you know, veganism versus quote unquote versus carnism. And to your point about debating, the goal mm. of a debate is to win. Mm. When you invite somebody to debate with you, you are inviting them to find every possible reason for why eating animals is the right thing to do. And studies have shown that when people debate, they become more entrenched in their position because they're convincing themselves over and over again each time they pull out an argument to prove that they're right because they don't want to lose the debate. Mm. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's such a great thing to, I guess, be aware of in conversations just to you just to know, okay, like this, I'm not in here. Just remind yourself as you're talking, I'm not in here to win right now. Um, like you were discussing before, I'm here to just share my own journey and just share my own, um, yeah, my own uh, experiences with this, right? And um, I guess it leads me on to to this this idea, and I I love the way you put it in Beyond Beliefs, um. The idea about um, the perfectionism mentality that a lot of vegans have uh, have as this kind of fundamentalist view of like what a vegan should be, um, and you describe becoming what's called like what you term sustainably vegan and being as vegan as possible. Um, can you explain what pressures are you know are apparent? for vegans that cause them to seek this perfection and to maybe feel less than if they're not you know, living up to these ideals as a vegan? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I, I also want to just point out that, you know, when I talk about having a healthy process, I'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be advocating veganism, you know, yeah. that we shouldn't be wanting to help other people move toward veganism. It's simply a matter of, you know, a way to help people be more open to our message in the first place, because we're already dealing with defensiveness. So when you communicate with a healthy process, you increase the chances that your message will be heard the way that you intend it to be. Mm. Um to your point about yeah. how vegans can become perfectionistic and, you know, kind of have this idea, this impossible ideal that we hold ourselves and others to at certain, you know, in, in certain ways. Um, this is the result of a, of a lot of things. I mean, people in general um, can be perfectionistic. Perfectionism is um, the result often and the cause of this, you know, sort of all or nothing thinking of, of an unnuanced view of human psychology and human behavior um, that many of us espouse, like many of us have not learned how to relate in a way that's healthy, you know, and that includes how we think about other people and ourselves. And we tend to put people into boxes and make judgments about them. So this is a human issue. Mm. Vegans have, you know, layers on top of this as well. Many vegans, because we care so deeply and we want so desperately to make a change in the world, we can be very hard on ourselves. People who are attracted to this movement tend to be conscientious, meaning they tend to be concerned with being a good person in the first place. And then we come into the movement and we often become traumatized um, being in the movement in large part because we're exposed to the reality that we are living in the midst of a global atrocity and atrocity is a mass traumatic event. Mm -hmm. We see videos and images of uh, horrific torture essentially and slaughter. And we see the remnants, you know, the consequences of this atrocity. As soon as we walk out our door or we open our laptop, you know, we're seeing billboards of people eating dead animals and we're sitting across from our own family members that are putting dead animals into their mouths and looking at us like something's wrong with us because we care. Mm -hmm. It's really crazy making. So we live in a world that really daily offends our deepest sensitivities and can, can really traumatize us. So we need to be very careful to, you know, number one, not ex overexpose ourselves to traumatic material. Um, you know, because this leads to that perfectionistic thinking, which I'll talk about in this in a second. But mm. it is really, really important. So many vegans say to me, oh, I just keep watching these videos because I feel obligated to. I feel like 
considering what the animals are going through, the least I can do is watch. But the animals don't need you to watch. You watching is not changing the fact that they are suffering. What you watching is doing is causing you to be increasingly trauma trauma traumatized. The animals do not need a movement of walking trauma survivors. They need a movement of healthy, self-connected people um, who are able to not bring their trauma into their activism so that they can advocate as effectively as possible. When we become traumatized, what can happen is it it affects us in, in various ways. Trauma affects the way that we think. It changes our thinking. And we start to see the world as one giant traumatic event with only three roles to be played. A person can be uh, either a perpetrator, mm. you know, if they're not a perpetrator, then they're a victim. And they're, if they're neither a perpetrator or a victim, then they're a hero. And we start to lose our capacity for nuance. And we start to put everyone, including ourselves, into one of these roles. And we start thinking to ourselves, well, if I'm not a victim, you know, I'm not hanging in a, in a factory, for example, and I'm not a perpetrator, I'm not a hero because I'm not doing a good enough job, well, then I must be a perpetrator. Mm. And we start holding ourselves and others to impossible standards. So it's really important for vegans to recognize and for everybody to recognize we all occupy all of these roles. As vegans, we're victimized by carnism. We become traumatized by carnism. We also can be perpetrators. We don't always treat other humans in a way that we're asking, you know, for them to be acting in the world. We're not always compassionate. We're not always inclusive. We haven't examined all of our other privileges besides human privilege a lot of the time. So it's we really need to, to have a more nuanced view. And most importantly, for anybody who's listening and, and wants to, you know, is questioning, well, how can I be more resilient? You know, how can I how can I be more sustainable so that I don't get traumatized or I undo some of the trauma I've experienced? The number one thing you can do is to commit to your own self-care, to commit to your own self-care. And what that means is taking care of your needs physical needs, psychological needs, emotional needs, social needs, and if you want your spiritual needs. The more you take care of yourself, the more you create a person who has a life in balance. When your life is in balance, you make healthier choices and you're a much more effective ambassador for whatever cause you choose to represent. You give yourself permission to treat yourself with the same compassion that you're asking others to access to treat animals with in the world, you will be making a huge investment in your ability to advocate on behalf of this cause. Mm. Yeah, so much, I think so much of it, because because there's so many elements to veganism and and I guess progressing morality, you know, as, as humankind progresses, and there's this whole like holier than thou ideal about, you know, what vegans consider to be a true vegan and and someone who's you know failing the movement or like you're not doing it enough and it it, it becomes tiring and so i just love that the that idea of yeah what is sustainable for you and what can you do and what's going to be what's going to make the biggest difference right um i did want to just quickly ask because i just sort of thought of something um in regards to the trauma side of things and i'd love to ask you as someone who is um, very in the know on human psychology, the idea of like different forms of advocacy and the idea of the um, on the street showing the the animal slaughterhouse footage to passers by who haven't you know technically given people consent for them to show that to them. Is this something that you would be um, overtly against? Because for someone like myself. That was the kind of stuff that got me in the first place, you know, and I would have been totally happy living out the rest of my life. And, and I, I grew up hunting and all this kind of stuff. So I've seen all that kind of thing. But when I saw it on a mass scale and, and kind of understood, oh, this is actually what we're doing. This is what got me. So I'd love to hear your view on that from a human psychology perspective. Like, is this something we should be doing more of or maybe pulling away from and, 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 and aiming for more of these uh, maybe more passive advocacy styles 
Yeah, it's a great question. I'm, and I don't know uh, that we have enough research to answer that question um, mm. really specifically. Okay. What I can say is that in general, um, if you don't get somebody's consent before showing them potentially traumatizing material, it is very easy for them to experience what you're doing as a form of emotional violence, um, which it, it essentially is. Um, and there are ways that you can creatively get people's consent, right? If you, if you really, if you're creating and you're doing street outreach and you want people to come and pay attention and see what you want them to see, you know, what you want to share with them, you can create a creative message which speaks to their interests and their needs. Hey, I'd love to share some information with you. Um, and here's why I think it's really useful and important for you to hear about this. Can I share this with you? And it doesn't have to be, and in my opinion, it should not be all slaughter imagery. In fact, you know, the jury is out on whether showing people images of, of bloody animals actually helps or is mm. actually less effective than mm. showing them pictures of animals who are just sad, for example, or dirty in farms or, you know, packed together. So uh, what we do as vegans is we tend to kind of feel like we got to hit people over the head, like watch earthlings. And, yeah. you know, most people do not need that much exposure. It takes very little exposure. And ideally that exposure is sandwiched between other things, other messages, happy farmed animals, for example, or happy animals, I should say, for example. Mm. Um, so, so I, I would be very careful with shocking people. And I do believe that we do need to expose people to the reality of, of what's going on. We just need to be careful. If people become traumatized by what you show them, they're going to see you as the perpetrator and their anger will be directed at you, the vegan, rather than at the real problem, which is animal agribusiness. The more respectful we can be in our outreach, the better. You mentioned earlier, um, you know, asking people to be as vegan as possible. And I think that's a very appropriate and important way to advocate veganism. Instead of saying, go vegan, try to be as vegan as possible. Nobody can be more vegan than what's possible for them. And people are much less defensive against this ask. And we can also, I always encourage vegans to ask people to be vegan allies, um, a supporter of veganism, even though they're not yet fully vegan themselves. And for many vegans, you know, you, we think understandably either you're vegan and you're part of the solution or you're not vegan and you're part of the problem. But then we prevent 99% of the population from supporting a cause that needs all the help it can get. And in my experience, non-vegans in my own life, my own personal experience, some of the people who have done the most for this cause are non-vegans and they're not even vegetarians. Wow. They're people who like interview me and get my message and our work in front of hundreds of thousands, even sometimes more people. They're donors to my organization that exists totally on donations. They want to help us do what we're doing. They're using their influence to change the world for animals and doing more for animals than a single vegan could possibly do simply through a lifetime of not eating animals. Mm. Yeah, no, I love that. I think that's a really, really good take home for, for people. And I guess to round this one out, Melanie, I don't want to take too much of your time here, but is there anything in terms of um, effective communication tips that we can leave the listeners with that maybe we haven't covered in this conversation so far? Um, are there any, any last sort of tips that you could give on you know effective communication or effective um, relationships? Well, I would say this is maybe less a tip and, and more uh, a point that I'd like to make. Um, mm. Building what I call relational literacy, which is the understanding of and ability to practice healthy ways of relating, um, is, in my opinion, the most important thing that anybody in this world can do if they want to create a better world um, and have, have better lives, essentially. The most important thing all of the problems that we as vegans and, and as social justice activists, you know, for those who are listening, who are working toward other social justice causes, we're trying to transform in the world are problems that are caused by dysfunctional ways of relating. And in our own movement, the biggest problems that we struggle with in our own movement or movements are dysfunction in terms of how we communicate with each other, toxic communication, you know, problems in organizations. The more relationally literate we are, the better we can transform these problems in our own lives and also more broadly in the world. So that is that's my take home message. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for anybody who wants more information about this, they can come to our website beyond Car Carnism's website at carnism.org. I have a new book um, called Getting Relationships Right. The whole book, it's a one stop guide to building relational literacy. And it 
is not written for vegans specifically. It's written for everybody. Um, and it's the book that if you are vegan and there are people in your life who you don't think would read Beyond Beliefs, um, but, but would be interested in a book and helping cultivate healthier relationality with others, um, this is a book that you could share with them. And hopefully it will also help them open up to some of these messages. Amazing. Yeah, you've got um, – there's. I was looking through your – your um, publishing just recently and I was like, wow, there's a lot of books I have to try and get through here. So I'm, uh, I'm still making my way through Beyond Beliefs because there's just so much good stuff in there. And I, I've literally like, I've got it on my Kindle here and literally half the thing is highlighted because I'm just like, everything I'm reading, I'm like, okay, gotta gotta highlight this. Gotta, it's like the whole thing's highlighted now. So um, I just want to give you a quick space to discuss what Beyond Carnism is, the organization and, and where we can find out more about that and what you guys are, are doing um, you know, in 2021 and, and, and further. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, yep, so Beyond Carnism is our international NGO, and our goal is to expose and transform gar- carnism globally. And we do this through awareness raising programs. We have um, a bunch of videos out on carnism that vegans can share with non vegans. Um, and we have a new, a new carnism awareness vegan uh, video coming out about what the world looks like through vegan eyes. So, any cool. vegans, you know, if you're, if you're thinking, I wish I could get my friends and family to understand what the world looks like through my eyes. This is, this is the video meant to do that. And our, our main program is the center for effective vegan advocacy, where we help people who are promoting awareness of veganism, plant-based eating to do so as effectively as possible and as sustainably as possible. Um, and so you can learn about that at our website as well at, um, at carnism.org. And and of course our, our meta mission is to help create a more relational world through, promoting relational literacy for vegan advocates, um, but also even beyond, um, because we really do believe that when people change, learn to change the way they relate, then we will be able to change the way we change our world. Mm. Great. Well, I'll, I'm going to link up everything, you know, your books and, and, and Beyond Carnism in the, in the show notes for this episode as well for people to check out. Um, I do like to finish each episode just with one final question, which is um, if you could uh, if, if, if you could have people have one eye opening experience in their life, what would it be? One eye opening experience. One eye opening experience. Yeah. Well, that's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. Yeah. Um, there are so many eye-opening exper- eye experiences people could have. I think any experience that that opens people's eyes to the um, anything that helps people recognize ways to bring themselves into a greater state of presence. That's being more self-connected, more connected with your compassion, essentially is something that's going to help improve your own life and improve the lives of anybody that you touch. I don't know what that what experience might be. It's different for anyone. Exactly. You can create this, obviously. You can have it yourself. But anything that helps you to feel more present, more self-connected and grounded in yourself, mm-hmm. and in, most importantly, connected with your own compassion, is, is an experience worth having and worth replicating and worth sharing. Brilliant. Well, that's perfect. Thank you so much, Melody, for coming on. I'm going to put this one together and I think the guys are going to love it and hopefully, you know, be able to implement some of these strategies into their own lives and their conversations and their relationships. And uh, if they want more, they can just go pick up your book and dive deep like I am. So um, thank you so much for giving up your time here, Melanie. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. And thank you too for all the awareness work, raising work you're doing. It's been a pleasure. So how about it, guys? How good is she? I would definitely suggest going and grabbing some of Melanie Joy's books, or if not, go ahead and jump onto YouTube and watch some of her seminars. There's a phenomenal conference uh, lecture on YouTube. I'll put the link in the show notes uh, all around this topic and just in greater detail. So I definitely suggest checking that one out. I guess as I come to summarize this thing, just remember guys that you do not have to be perfect and this is something I struggle with due to my personality type trying to do things to the highest standard and trying to have all of the answers but just remember learn to say I don't know not feel like you always have to have the answers to the questions posed to us which you do not have and you cannot have 
I guess if I was going to give some key takeaways from this episode that we could use practically today, number one would be just having a quality conversation, not a debate. It's not about making the other person lose and about you winning or about converting somebody. It's about planting a seed. Secondly, it's not just about facts and knowing all the information. Share your story instead. Your story is valid and people want to hear it, but they don't want to be pressured or forced into believing something. Thirdly, remember your own carnism. You were once in their shoes, right? We all, most of us, I can't say we all, but most of us grew up eating animal products. So you were once there. Have some empathy for that person in front of you and understand where they're at. And I guess lastly, encourage people to be as vegan as possible. Making it approachable, digestible, um, manageable for people to implement into their lives. Everyone can do something. And if we have a world full of people doing what is possible for them, we end up with a largely vegan world. And I think we can all agree that's going to be a huge positive for so many areas of how we operate on this earth. Thank you so much for, for listening to this podcast team. I really appreciate every single one of you. The fact that you've got my voice in your brain and your ears right now is an amazing thought to me. And I love to, to see your posts of where you're listening from, uh, what episode you're listening to. So please do a screenshot, share it around. More people then can then jump on an episode like this and benefit from the practical takeaways. If you've got time, take a couple of minutes, give me a review on the Apple Podcast app. That one will actually help more people see this episode as well. So it's probably the best thing you can do if you want to support me. And lastly, guys, if you're not involved in some kind of vegan community or have vegan friends around you, get involved in something. Jump on a Facebook group. Just get involved in the Vegan Body Coach Instagram page. Um, and I do want to, it's kind of under wraps, but I've got something in the works for an online community that is away from social media coming in the next few months that I think you would love to be on board with so that you do have people that you can do life with, that you can share experiences with, and that you can feel comfortable and accepted with. So be on the lookout for that one. But for now, get involved in a community, find some people like you, and we can do this thing together. That's it. Next episode in a couple of weeks. I was going to say my normal tagline, but I think somebody else is now using it. If you've heard, you'll know. Um, but maybe I'll bring it back. In the meantime, go live something, eat some more plants, and we will catch up very soon.